Amen. All right, if you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 1 for the reading of the text. Hebrews chapter number 1. We're also going to pass around the offering plate. <clears throat> Again, that's Hebrews chapter number 1. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Bible said, God in sundry times and in thy first manner speaking time past unto the fathers by the Father. Because it's the pastor's birthday, I just get to take everything from the plate. What do you find in the cell? I, I started, I started. He made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits? Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. You want to pray for us? Amen. All right, we are in Hebrews chapter number one, beginning our Bible study through the book of Hebrews uh, this week. Last week, we of course went through the introduction of the book of Hebrews. We established uh, Paul as the author, and I went over a few of the themes of the book of Hebrews, some of the things that we can learn, uh, who actually the book of Hebrews was written to, and why you know it is believed that it is written to the Hebrews. And I also do uh, agree and believe uh, that as well, that it is written to the Jews or uh, the Hebrews. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 1, reading. The Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So the Bible begins here in Hebrews chapter number 1 telling us that God, and then it says, who at sundry times and in divers manners, Manner. So if you're not familiar with what the word sundry means, it actually just means divers, as you see there. Now divers, we would today spell that diverse. You would actually transpose the S and the E, diverse as in different. That's what that means. And that's exactly what sundry means as well. It means different times and in different manners. And manners just means ways. So God spoke at different times throughout history and in different ways to the fathers by the prophets. Now last week I gave you a few reasons why I did believe that it is written to the Hebrews or to the Jews. I just alluded to that a moment ago. Here is actually another reason why I believe that here in verse number one. 
Notice how he refers to those that he spoke uh, to through the prophets. It says, they spake in time past, and he says, unto the fathers by the prophets. So you can see how that is very much relatable if he is writing to a Jew or he is writing to a Hebrew. Um, one thing that I want to go ahead and tell you is we are going to be turning throughout the Bible a massive amount tonight. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a very, very deep book. It's extremely deep and there is layer upon layer of subjects and doctrines in every single chapter. There's only 14 verses, but Hebrews chapter 1 is a melting pot of doctrine. We're going to touch on all different things from inspiration of scripture that we're going to talk about right now, the sonship of Christ, the deity of Christ, and angels, sons of God, so many different things in this chapter alone and establish some truths that we can learn and purge from this chapter, Hebrews chapter number 1. So, the next thing that I want to point out is this. It says, he, it says that God spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Here in verse number 1 of the book of Hebrews, in chapter 1, we can establish the inspiration of Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture. I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 20. 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 20. We'll see this mentioned here again as well, just to the right in your Bible. 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 20, the Bible says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Then it tells us this in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I want you to notice there that it says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So notice that it is the Holy Ghost that is moving them. It is God's Spirit inside of them that is actually giving or bringing the Word of God to uh, the fathers or to even, you could say, the Jews at that time, the nation of Israel. So here we can see that, that holy men of God spake. We look over in Hebrews chapter number 1, and there it says that God spake, right? Because this is God, through the Holy Spirit, speaking His Word through holy men. He's using holy men to speak and to, and to uh, speak his words to prophesy to the nation of Israel and then it is written down and of course that is scripture. I want you to go now to first or I'm sorry second Timothy chapter number three. We're going to see this again two real strong verses pretty close to Hebrews 1 on the subject of inspiration of scripture. This is actually where we get that phrase the inspiration of scripture. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the Bible here says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now the word inspiration here does not mean just influence. That's oftentimes how we use the word today. You know, that really inspired me. And what we mean is that really, that really uh, influenced me. The word inspiration, inspiration, its root etymology actually comes from the word God or the words God breathed. You know, spirit is really the root word of that there and that comes from the word breath. When we think of respiration, right? It's breathing again. Well, the in there means to breathe in too. So we believe that the scriptures are God breathed, that he is actually the one that breathed or spake the word of God. He spake it through the holy man. And that's what we see being summarized there in Hebrews chapter number 1. So we can see the inspiration of Scripture being taught here in Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 1. Not only that, it's interesting that he says this. If you stop and you think about it, he says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So here Paul is actually establishing that, establishing that there were different times throughout history and different prophets throughout history that spake the word of God. But not only that, he says that he did it in different manners. Now as I said... And specifically, he says divers' manners, right? That means different ways. Now, when you think about that, and we look back to the Old Testament, we can see what that means. You know, Moses, the way in which God spake through Moses, who was a holy man, who wrote down, we believe, the first five books of the Bible, he came down off the mount, and he had, you know, the Ten Commandments, and he brought the Word of God to them in that way, or in that manner, right? We look down through uh, at the prophets, all of the prophets of the Old Testament. There are so many different examples where he spake to them in different ways or in different manners. Look at the prophet Ezekiel. One of the, one of the uh, um, you know, uh, illustrations that 
happens to Ezekiel and is used for the children of Israel is that his wife dies. His wife dies and that is meant to be a, a, uh, a, a word of the Lord to the people. They come to him and they ask, you know, what does this mean? Because he's not allowed to mourn. He's not allowed to cry. They come and they ask him the question, what does this mean? And then he explains them. Jeremiah brings the yoke of wood. I remember Hananiah the seer. Hananiah the seer comes and breaks it. And then he comes back and he, and he has the, the yoke of iron the next time, right? And then, you know, you have Isaiah who came uh, uh, barefoot and naked. So you have these different ways in which God spake. That's what it means when it says divers manners. It means different ways that he spake to them. He, they brought the word of God in a different way, uh, oftentimes with each prophet. And even each prophet spake also in different ways. So God would often uh, use illustrations, and this is the different manners, I believe, that it is referring to, that he would uh, bring the Word of God to them. And as I mentioned, their fathers is, of course, referring to uh, uh, the Israelites. And I believe that's why he says the fathers. It's like saying our fathers the same way, because he's writing to a Hebrew, he's writing to a Jew. Verse number 2, the Bible says this, Hath, now this is still talking about God, same, same uh, uh, sentence, Hath, so God hath, in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, there's a controversy amongst, you know, the subject of the nature of God, the Trinity, and all of that about the sonship of Christ. That's really at the core issue. Now, here we at Valiant Baptist Church reject the teaching of the eternal sonship of Christ. And we believe in the incarnational sonship. And what that means is that we believe that when Christ is referred to as the Son of God, that it is referred to Him being born on this earth as a man. And that sonship is a reference to the flesh and His birth that He had as a man. Because the Son has a birth. And we're really going to delve into this all throughout this chapter. There are many verses that teach us a lot about specifically His sonship and how He is the Son of God. Now, we reject the teaching of the eternal sonship of Christ, and that is that you know, Christ was eternally the Son of God. And some would go so far as to say that He was eternally in the flesh. Right? Of course, we reject all of that. We do not believe that the Bible teaches that that is preposterous. We don't believe that at all. Amen. So here it says this, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. Now, notice, number one, I want you to notice the distinction here between God and His Son. Now, the distinction is not that the Son is not God. This is the mystery of godliness, and that is that the God, that God, the one true God, is the Son. But there is a distinction, and that is understood in the humanity of Christ. Now, when we look at what this is teaching, it's, it's clearly telling us that in the Old Testament, God spake unto the fathers by the prophets. Then it contrasts that with the fact that today, in these last days, He speaks unto us by His Son. So there's an implication and a, pol a polarity there where it's polarizing these two things and saying, in the Old Testament, God spake by the prophets to the fathers. And it, then it's saying, in the New Testament, now God speaks by His Son. And let me clarify again, I want to make this very, very clear. We believe that the Son of God is God. And not a God, the one true God, the Lord Jehovah of the Old Testament. So, just in case someone's confused about me contrasting God, or I'm sorry, I'm making a distinction between God and the Son of God. Ultimately, it is the same person. God is the Son of God, and the Son of God is God. Not to say there's not a distinction. So that's a little bit outside of it. I don't want to dive too much into that yet. So right now what it's telling you is that in the last days He speaks unto us by His Son. You know what the implication is? That the Son didn't speak in the Old Testament. Do you know why? Because the flesh wasn't there in the Old Testament. That's why. So that makes perfect sense with my doctrine. If I reject the eternal Sonship of Christ and acknowledge that the Sonship is a reference to the flesh, well that makes perfect sense with me. But you know what it doesn't make perfect sense with? the Trinitarian, Orthodox, Catholic Trinitarian who believes that Jesus is a second person other than God and that He has eternally been the Son. Because you know why? There are a bunch of passages where you can prove in the Old Testament that it's the person of the Son. That it's the, the same person. Now, Jesus, the, the Son, is that same person of the Old Testament. He's that same person. But He wasn't the Son then. 
He became the son later. And that is a specific title that you refer to the man. That's why it says that the son spake today. And he didn't speak in the Old Testament because <clears throat> he wasn't a son in the Old Testament. He became the son when he was born on this earth as a man. That's not his origin as far as his soul and who he is as his inner core. That is just the beginning of God's life on this earth as a man. You know, people are so disingenuous because they'll even try to say that we here believe that that's like the beginning of you know, Christ's existence. And that we believe that that's when Jesus began and that he didn't exist before that. When these same fools would acknowledge that there was a time in which the second person began his life on the earth. Wouldn't they say, yeah, there was a time with that? Well, I'm just saying that that's when he began his sonship too, you fool. And that prior to that, he was in existence too in the same way that you believe it, but not as a second person. So you can see how they're disingenuous in the first place because they believe the same thing. I just believe that the sonship is referring to his life on this earth and that's when he acquired his flesh. So notice the implication. It's that the son didn't speak in the Old Testament. It jives perfectly with the incarnational sonship, but it does not jive with the teaching that he was eternally the son. Now the son is a new title that is given unto him now that he is become a man. Now, in, in the, is that to say, like I just mentioned a moment ago, that he, that he didn't exist? Of course not. He was God. And he was also the Word of God. Because the Bible teaches in John chapter number 1. I want you to go ahead and turn to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1 teaches that all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter number 1 and into eternity past. God's Word was there with him. The Word of God has always eternally dwelt with him. John chapter number 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, Word there just means Word. Just like Word means Word in every other place in your Bible. It just means the Word of God. And here it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. So the Word was there with Him. There's a distinction between God and His Word, of course. And then it says this, And the Word was God. I believe that literally the Word of God is God. I believe that literally. And we know, of course, that the Word was made flesh. And I believe that God's words, which are spirit and life, Jesus said, were made flesh and dwelt among us. And at the same time, that was God dwelling among us. God himself dwelling among us. So before he was the son, he was actually known as the son. Who was he? He was God and he was the word of God. And of course he is today as well. He's just taken on the new title or the new way in which we'll refer to him as the son of God because he has the flesh now. Because he actually is the son of God. Look there back at Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 2. It says this now. <clears throat> whom, of course referring there to the Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Then it says this. By whom also he made the worlds. So there it is saying that the Son made the worlds. Now someone could look at that and say, well, that's kind of confusing. I thought you just said a moment ago that the Son was he who was incarnate in the flesh. I want you to keep your hand here and go over to Hebrews chapter number 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 3. Remember, John chapter number 1 told us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want you to look here at Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 3. It says this, Through faith we understand, now watch this, that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So what does Hebrews chapter number 11, 3 teach? How in which the worlds were created. By what? By the Word of God. Now is that a person? Or is that just the Word of God? Right? It's just the Word of God. It's just His spoken Word. Right? It is His literal Word of God. Now if we understand that the Son is... A, 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 new, a new term by which we refer to God and you could even say the Word of God because He was made flesh. It makes perfect sense how that you could say that the Son today created, God created the world by, by I'm sorry, let me reword that statement. You, it would make perfect sense and you could understand why, how in which God could make the statement 
that he created the worlds by his son. Because who was the son? He was the incarnate word of God. And where does the Bible, what does the Bible say elsewhere how in which God created the world? Created it by his word. And over and over again we can prove that it is by his literal word. I want you to go now with me to Psalm chapter number 33, verse number 6. This is the greatest passage to prove that it is his literal word. That it is his spoken word. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 33 Verse number 6, it says this, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And then it says this, And all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So what does it mean when the Bible says that he created the world by his words? It means that he created it by the breath of his mouth. You know what you do when you speak to someone? You breathe. You breathe out. That's why the Bible says, and I just referenced this, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Because God breathed these words as he spake the words, right? What we have here in scripture. So we see that Jesus Christ was the word of God made flesh. And it makes perfect sense why he could now refer to him as the son of God because he's made flesh. And also at the same time, you know, we know that God is his own word. So it is God in the flesh. I did have to hit on all of that right there. It gets a little bit of little bit confusing. Go back to Hebrews chapter number one. A little bit confusing because I'm not preaching a full sermon on that. I'm just alluding to some of those things because it's in the text, but we can definitely purge information. And if you already have a foundation on these subjects, it, it I'm sure makes sense to everyone here. I wanted to hit on those things. So also notice it says this hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Then it goes on and says this, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So there it's of course speaking about how God created the world by his words in that last statement. If we look up also in Genesis chapter number one, we can see how God created the world. It tells you over and over again how God created the world, right? By the breath of his mouth. You see, God said, let there be light. It's one person one God speaking over and over again and His Word creating everything. So, I'm glad that God recorded exactly what took place in Genesis chapter number 1. And I can go back to that and people can't twist that. So, I have the clear statements all throughout the Bible that it's created by His literal Word. And then I go back to it and I can actually read the account play by play of what took place. And it's not one person telling another person. You know what it is? It's one God, one person there saying, let there be light. And there was light. I'm glad that God recorded that for us. Also here, I want to point out another thing. It says this, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Go to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. So we're going to be doing a lot of flipping as I said. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8, we can see a reference to this also here. In Romans 8, look at verse number 32. It says this, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, and then notice what it says, freely give us all things. So what is he going to give us? I want you to notice that. What is he going to give us? All things. Why? With him. Because we are co-inheritors with Christ. Because we are you know, in Christ, therefore we are what? The Son of God also. That's why here it makes the statement, it says, Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Just like we are heir of all things. He's going to freely give us all things, just like he is going to give them to Christ. By whom also he made the world. Verse 3, it says this, Who bring, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high these first three verses are just packed things are going to slow down here in a minute but I want to hit everything that I possibly can everything that I that I uh, uh, like as I said as I possibly can here and try to give you you know all of the knowledge that I feel that I have in these verses there in verse number three first it says this who being the brightness of of his glory. Now that right there is a powerful verse. When it's comparing, you know, God the Father to the Son of God, do you know what it is? He doesn't lose any glory. It says that he is the brightness of his glory, right? Then it goes on to say this, and the express image of his person. Now when it says his person, who is it referring to? 
God, right? That's the Father, of course, because there's there right here is, of course, the, the, the distinction of God and His Son. So if it's His Son, then what role does He have when it comes to the relationship? God, that is. The Father, of course, right? So we're speaking about the Father, and notice what it says, the image of His person. And what title is He given? In Hebrews 1, chapter 1, verse 1, God. God. Now, what God is it talking about? It's the God of the Old Testament. It's the God that spake in the Old Testament. So you couldn't try to say there, oh, well, this is just the Father. No, this is the God who spake in the Old Testament. There is only one God, the Father. I mean, you know, you already obviously have a, uh, you know, a misconception when it comes to the nature of God in the first place, right? There is only one God, and it is the Father. And this, you can actually prove that because it's the God who spake in time past. It's the God who spake Scripture and spake the Word through the prophets in the Old Testament. So when you see a statement in the Old Testament... And Jesus, and he does this many times, you know, he'll, he'll uh, uh, you know, say that, that he is the I am, like when he's speaking in John chapter number 8, right? And that is, of course, a statement that the Lord Jehovah made in the Old Testament out of the burning bush to Moses. That's one of the times when God is speaking through the prophets. And who is that here? It's the Father, isn't it? But who did Jesus say that he was? That he was that God. So, there again, you can prove that Jesus is that God who is the Father Right? And the God of the Old Testament. So it says, the image of His person. So, God here it, it is defined as being what? It says, His person. How many people is God? You're right. So that's a, a misleading uh, question in the first place. One, God is referred to as a person. And it's not only here. I want you to go to Job chapter number 13. Job chapter number 13. The book of Job, Job chapter number 13, we'll see this again. So that's not only one scripture, it's not being twisted. We actually have backup scripture for that. Go to Job chapter number 13, look at verse number 7. We speak wickedly for God, so we're talking about God, and talk deceit, deceitfully for Him, that's God. Verse 8, will ye accept His person? Will ye contend for God? So notice right there that God again is referred to as a person. It's not the three persons of God or God is three people. The God of the Old Testament is an individual singular person. And that comes from Scripture in Job chapter number 13 verse number 8 and also Hebrews chapter number 1 verse number 3. You can prove that God is an individual singular person person, which you don't need the word person. I'm glad we have those scriptures. Again, I'm glad that we have those two scriptures. But over and over and over again, the God of the Old Testament is so clear that it's just Him. Over and over again, He says, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. He talks about, I lift up my hand to heaven when I wet my glittering sword. And He goes on and on and on, and He explains that He is the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I mean, it could be any clear that there's one God. He's a singular person. He refers to himself as thee and thou over and over and over again. You don't, you don't have to have that you know, high of an IQ to understand that the God of the Bible is one person. It's very easily discernible. But you know what? We have verses. Hebrews chapter number 1 verse number 3 says that God is a person. Now the, the ball will be in the Trinitarian, the Orthodox Trinitarian's court. Show me one verse where the Bible says that God is persons, plural. One time. It's not there. Right. Not one single time. That should be alarming to you when someone, when someone you know, uh, uh, man, uh, you know, makes it mandatory that you must refer to them as persons. When that word is not found in the Bible one time. Not even one time. The concept isn't found. Not at all. Over and over again, we can see that God is singular. There's no one with Him. He's one over and over and over again. The emphasis is put on the fact that there is one God. It's a He, and we serve Him. And this is His person. And I want you to notice that it says this, and the express image of His person. I want you to go back to John chapter number 1 with me. John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. <clears throat> There in John chapter number 1, and I'm going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, and I want to read from you, read for you from 1 Timothy chapter number 3, 
The Bible talks about this same subject. So it says he is the express image of his person. We know God through Christ Jesus. That's how we know God. God became a man. He entered into his own creation so that we could know him and so that we could see him. God naturally, the Bible tells us, is a spirit. So what God did, we are flesh. We live in this physical world, in this creation. God entered into the creation so we could see him, we could know him, and we could have a relationship with him. He could relate unto us. And Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. It says in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, Verse number 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You know, when Jesus Christ came, it was not just a man being born, a divine man, and, and a, the angel of the Lord, like, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses will teach that it's Michael the archangel and all this garbage. It was God being manifest in the flesh. That's what it was. It was God being born as a man. <clears throat> John chapter number 1 Verse number 14 says this, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now watch this. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So notice that we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and and truth. He's referred to as the express image of his person. So he is the image of the inv invisible God, the Bible says in the book of Colossians. Not only that, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It is the, the one true God manifest in the flesh. And when you see the Lord Jesus Christ, do you know who you see? You see God. You see the one and only true God. And that is exactly what Jesus was saying. When, when Philip asked that question to Jesus in John 14, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus responded and said, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Exactly what he is, what he is responding with is there's nothing else to see this is it. I am the express image of his person because he is that one and only true God born in the flesh. Amen. The one and only true God became a man and we could see him and we could look at him and one day we will lay our eyes upon the creator, the God of the universe and you know who you'll see? You'll see the image of Jesus Christ. That's who you'll see. Amen. You'll see the Son of God and you'll look upon that body that he had when he was born on this earth as a man, a glorified version of that body. That's what we'll see when we get to see God. I want you to go back to Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. So these verses are going to, it's going to feel like we, you know, spent a lot of time on this, but we'll speed up a little bit here in just a moment. It says this now, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged, our sins. I want you to notice that he did this by himself. Now this is going to be a theme throughout the book of Hebrews and one of the reasons why, and I spoke last week about why uh, all the reasons proving that Paul was the author of the book of Hebrews and a group of people, a faction of people that would, you know, are saved, they're, they're Bible believers and, and they actually call themselves that exactly, independent fundamental Baptist, uh, they are dispensational and they are staunchly against Paul being the apostle or the, I'm sorry, the author of the book of Hebrews. And the reason why is because they say, hey, Paul was the apostle to the uh, uncircumcision. He's not the apostle to the circumcision. And they believe that, he, that Paul preached something different than what Peter preached. And they believe that the book of Hebrews is for a different dispensation, which they for, refer to that as a different time period. And that is because there are some uh, uh, hard to understand passages, I believe, in the book of Hebrews. And of course, they draw this major distinction between what they say, you know, the church and Israel and things like that. Now, here in uh, uh, verse number three, he makes this statement, when he had by himself purged our sins. Dispensationalists, one thing that they will, they strongly teach is that, and these are, this would be hyper-dispensationalists, that salvation was different in the Old Testament than it is today. And they believe that, you know, there was uh, aspects of them having to keep the law. And they actually believe that the lamb that they sacrificed and the sacrifices themselves uh, in a way atoned for the sins of uh, the man that lived under the law in the Old Testament. But that's one of the themes of the book of Hebrews. In a few chapters, we're going to see that over and over again, and we already see it popping up here in verse number 3. Notice what it says. 
by himself purged our sins. No lamb, no literal physical lamb or sheep or, or goat helped him. He did it 100% by himself. There was no other person that helped him atone for or pay for our sins. It was only Jesus Christ. It was God himself, the Son of God, that paid for the sins of all mankind. He is the only one. He is the only one that could. A, a, a man has to pay for the sins of another man. If a man deserves the punishment, well, you can't you know, take something that is not equal to that and, and sacrifice a frog for it. It doesn't even make sense. You have to punish flesh. If flesh deserves flesh, in order to be just and God is an exactor, you must punish flesh. So you know what Jesus did? You know what God did? He became a man so that he could take that punishment that your flesh deserves and your flesh deserves. He took it in the flesh because God is just and he is an exactor. And he paid for all of the sins that that no goat could ever atone for or no lamb could ever atone for. He paid for the sins in his own flesh and he did it by himself with no help of anyone or any other thing. Then it says this, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. We believe that. We believe that Jesus Christ is seated in heaven right now on the right hand of God. Now, here's the thing. People have tried to attack us about this and they've tried to say, well, uh, you know, they, and they'll teach that there are two thrones in heaven. You can clearly prove, and I'm not going into this right now because there's so much in the book of Hebrews. You can so clearly prove that there's only one throne in heaven. It's, a hundred, it's so clear. There's only one throne in heaven. There are not multiple thrones. There's only one throne in heaven. Now, does that mean that there's not a distinction between the Father and the Son still today? I still believe that that distinction still lies. That there, at the same time that that mystery is still there. That there is, the, there is God, the one true God who is the Father, and that He became flesh, and there is this distinction. And I believe that that distinction, and God will forever exist as the Son of God. Now, God is invisible. The Lord is invisible. And I believe that His, and His Spirit is in all places. You can't, you can't take God and just shove Him into this little box you know, like that, and saying, well, now he stopped being this and he started being that. that that's modalism, and that's false, Amen. right? He exists eternally as God, which is the Father, and the Son of God, eternally and forever will be. And the Son of God went to heaven, and he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I believe that 100%. 100%. Look at verse number 4. It says this, Being made so much better than the angels. Now that is referring to the Son. And really verse, verse 4 right now, where we are kind of moving into what is the theme of chapter number 1. And then it spills into chapter number 2. Just a little bit. And the theme is that the Son is greater than the angels. The Son is greater than... The angels. So we saw the Son being introduced with a lot of long, you know, adjective phrases there, praising the Son in those first couple of verses. And then it stopped there at verse number four. That was all one st sentence and still all, all the way is into verse number four. It ends. That, se that first sentence ends in verse number four. And it ended with this. Being made so much better than the angels. Saying that the Son of God was made so much better than the angels. And then it goes on and says this. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So what does it mean that he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they? Who inherits something? A son. That's exactly what it's referring to. A son. So by his inheritance, the, facts that, the fact that he is a son, he obtained a more excellent name than they. And that name is referring to the fact that he is a son. That he is the son of God. That he has that name and that title, the son of God. So right here in verse number 4, we already see that God is comparing uh, the... He, what he's doing is comparing Jesus, the Son of God, to the angels. And, he, and it says already that Jesus is greater than, or the Son of God is greater than the angels. And why? Because he hath by inheritance. The fact that he is the Son of God, he obtained or he received... Uh, uh, obtained is what it says, a more excellent name than they, which is being the Son of God. We're going to delve into this right now, and that is the fact that the angels are not the angels are not the sons of God. I'm going to focus on this for a few minutes here. So it already starts out by contrasting that. Now I want you to look at verse number five. I'm going to show you that further of what it's teaching. For so it's going to talk about the name that Jesus has that the angels do not have. For Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, 
This day have I begotten thee. Now what name did God call Jesus there? The Son. That is a name. Father can be a name. It's just a, it's just a title or something you call someone. Just like in uh, Isaiah 9.6. You know, the, the son is called, the name that he's called is what? The everlasting father. It's referred to as a name. So father's a name. It just means title is what that means. So we can see that the name that it's referring to here is son. That's the name that he has by inheritance. So that makes perfect sense. Son saying that, that the angels don't have this name. They don't have the name of the son. And that's why it says this. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So the question is a hypothetical question. And it's saying, which of the angels did he ever say, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? What's the answer to the hypothetical question? Never. He never did. Why? Because Jesus, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than the angels. So he never referred to the angels as son, but he referred to Jesus as son. That's, that's further proven because I know there was, there was a, a, you know, the, the, the possible rejection of this passage and of this teaching, and they tried to interpret it this way, and I'm going to show you that that's not the correct interpretation. They tried to interpret it this way, that this is a compound sentence, and that part of it refers to uh, uh, what he is actually saying that the, he never said to the angels. And then the other part of it, you know, you know, maybe that's up for grabs. Maybe he did say that about the angels. And then they tried to go to other passages and show that to you. But I'm actually going to prove that not to be true right now. And I'll show you that. So it says this. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now watch verse 5. And again. So what's it doing? It's, it's exactly. It's, it's restating the same question. You know, uh, it just in a different way. When did, he, when did he ever, or another question about the same subject, sorry. It's restating another question about the exact same subject. So, the first question was, did he ever say to any of the angels, you're my son, this day have I begotten thee? Now, the rejection of this is, well, he's never said that entire statement, right? I, I misconveyed that thought a moment ago. I apologize for that. The rejection is this. He's never said the entire statement to the angels because... He has never said that he begat the angels. So you could still use that. That doesn't mean that the angels aren't the Son of God because one qualifies and the other doesn't. So you could still use this statement because, yeah, the angels are the sons of God, but he never begat them. So that's how people try to get around this and still call the angels the Son of God. So I apologize for misconveying that a moment ago. But that doesn't hold up water with the, next pass with the very next question because it says this, and again... So it's restating the same type of question again. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now that has nothing to do with being begotten, does it? It doesn't even mention it. You notice that? But it's saying that he never said this to the angels. And what was it? That, you know, they were his son and that he was their father. They, it's, that's never been said to any of the angels. Now it's important to understand the whole context and where in which we started. And what was it? It was the context that Jesus is greater than the angels because he has the inheritance of being the son. And that's what, that was in, introduced of him being the son in verse number 2. Now, I want to show you that this continues, this questioning about him being the son, being the son of God, and angels not being the son of God even further. The same subject, verse 6, and again. So we're still on the same subject. That, that God never said any of these things to the angels, but He said these things to the Son. These are things that, that prove that the Son is greater than the angels. And what is it? Look at verse number uh, 6. And again, when He bringeth in the first begotten into the world, watch this, He saith, and let all the angels of God worship Him. So notice we're still on the same subject. And what is it? That Jesus is greater than the angels. So we didn't stop talking about the angels. How does, it, how does this prove that Jesus is greater than the angels? Because the angels are worshiping Him. Right? So that proves, and this is very important, that proves that in verse 5, that last statement in verse 5, the last verse that is quoted, is also still proving that Jesus is greater than the angels. And how? Because He has never said to any of the angels, You're my son. So it's not only, you, you can't just write off the first part of that verse where it's quoting from the book of Psalms where he says, 
Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, by making the claim that, well, it's a compound question. And there are two aspects to this question, and part of it, you know, is true and part of it's not. So the whole thing still is true. That, that doesn't work because the question's asked again after that. Other questions are asked, and do you know what the core of the questions are? The angels are not the sons of God, but Jesus is. And because of that, Jesus is greater. So it still teaches the same thing. You can still prove that the angels are not the sons of God very clearly by this passage. But furthermore, on top of that as well, I know we're on this and I'm you know, giving a lot of information all at the same time. On top of that as well, it's silly to say that someone could be begotten and not be a son. Or someone could be a son and not be begotten. Either one. They're both foolish. Neither one of them make any sense at all. So they try to claim, well, the angels are sons of God, but they were never begotten. In order to be a son, you have to be begotten. That's what makes you a son. That's how you become a son. So that makes no sense at all. That's why that verse was even quoted in the first place. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Saying, you're my son now. And you know what else that proves? It debunks eternal sonship. And it proves incarnational sonship. And that this is a reference to when Jesus was born on this earth as a man. You know, begotten, to be specific, begotten means to be conceived. So this whole passage is speaking about him being conceived, him becoming flesh, and then ultimately being born on this earth as a man. So that debunks right there, eternal sonship, we can see that. And then it goes on and says, verse 5, And again, I will be to him a father. Notice the future tense. I will be. This is talking about when he's born now. He's going to be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Verse 6, And again, watch this, When he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Now we can see that taking place in the book of Luke. What's, what's, uh, what's, what's real cool about these three verses is there's a bunch of quotations from the Old Testament. But right there in verse number 6, that's obviously not a quote from the Old Testament. You can't find that in the Old Testament anywhere. You can look up all those words. And the reason why is because it says, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world. Because when did it take place? So here is actually right. When he was born, it's saying that this was spoken. Actually at that time. Now the other ones, this is really cool, the other ones were, were spoken in the Old Testament. But they were spoken like present tense. Like it was happening at that time. And God will oftentimes do that because he sees the end from the beginning. You know, he says, uh, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. So he can speak. Uh, you know, like things have already come to pass. And he will do that from time to time. Uh, he'll speak uh, about prophecies like they've already been fulfilled sometimes, you know, in the Bible. So, those couple of verses there, people will try to use those verses where it says, This day have I begotten thee. They'll try to say, well, that was fulfilled in the Old Testament. Because it says, This day have I begotten thee in the Old Testament. But that's a case of one of those prophecies that is being spoken of as, as though it has already been fulfilled, but it's still yet to come. And the proof of that is it tells you when that actually day took place. Because verse number 6 is not a quotation from the Old Testament. As I said, you can you know, you know, spend as much time as you want trying to look that up. It's not in the Old Testament because it's not an Old Testament scripture and it tells you that. It says, and when... And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world. So when did this take place? At the time when he was born. It says this, He saith and let all the angels of God worship him. So that's when those other two prophecies were also actually fulfilled. Right at that same, right around that same time. You know, he brought in the first begotten into the world. That's when those scriptures are actually being fulfilled. I want you to look with me at verse number 7. So that was pretty deep right there and we hit a lot of things all at the same time. Look at verse number 7. It says this, And of the angels he saith, so this is what he says about the angels, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So that's a quotation from Psalm chapter number 104, verse number 4. Verse 8, But, now that's a, a, a conjunction and it's a contrasting conjunction. He's again going to tell you why. Uh, Jesus is greater than the angels. So that's the subject. But unto the Son he saith, 
Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Which statement is better, verse 7 or verse 8? Verse 8. You see, you see the point that he's trying to make. Hey, this is what he says about the angels, and it's pretty cool. You know, he makes his angels, spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the sun, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What's the point? He was made so much better than the angels, right? That's the whole theme of this passage, going back and forth, just proving out Jesus, how great Jesus is, and he's greater than the angels. It says this in verse number 8, thy throne, O God. So what was Jesus just referred to as? God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A very clear passage where Jesus is referred to as God. He is called God. So in the exact same passage here, Hebrews 1, where we see him being called Son, what is he also called? God. You know why? Hebrews chapter number 1, that is that same God. God. There's only one God. The God of Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 8, there where it says, Thy throne, O God, is the same God of Hebrews 1, verse 1, first word, God. Same God, same per person. There is no difference at all. He says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So that's a quotation from Psalm chapter number 45, verses uh, 6 and 7. Verse number 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You know what we see right here is we see the humanity of Christ. We see the humanity of Christ. We see God in heaven. The one true God in heaven and also simultaneously that one same God living on this earth as a man. And notice what it says. It points you to the humanity. It says this, that he anointed thee with the oil of gladness. Watch this. Above thy fellows. What does that mean, fellow? What is a fellow? It's someone you have something in common with. Right? If you say like, a, like a, 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 you know, uh, my fellow workers. Right? The peop, that's the people that you work with. So what does it mean above thy fellows? It means above his brethren. Right? It means above other men. That's what it's saying. Saying God in heaven anointed Jesus Christ above his fellows. So what, what we see there is the one true God in heaven anointing the Son of God, who is God manifest in the flesh. He didn't go through, you know, just a, simu a simulator. That's not what happened. He actually, he didn't go through the motions. He genuinely became a man and lived on this earth as a man, the one true God did. And he proved himself to God in heaven. Amen. He proved himself. And he pleased God in heaven. And he had a relationship with God in heaven. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. And God in heaven was pleased with him. And it says that he anointed him. He anointed him with the oil of gladness, he says, above thy fellows. So it's a reference to his humanity. Above his fellows. His, his fellow you know, humans or human uh, brethren. Verse 10, and thou Lord. Who's this talking about? I'm talking about the Son still. What, what is he called now? Lord. And, and thou Lord in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Now that's actually a quote from uh, actually verses 10 through 12 here qu is quoting... Psalm chapter number 102, uh, and it's verse 25 through 27. If you wanted to look that up later, you can look that up. And it is speaking about Jehovah when it says, And thou, Lord. It's speaking about Jehovah. Who is it speaking about here? It's speaking about Jesus. You know what it says? And thou, Lord. That's talking about Jehovah. In the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. You know what that, you know what that proves? It's Jesus is Jehovah. Right. right here in Hebrews chapter number 1, we don't get very far. Hebrews chapter number 1, we can prove that Jesus is Jehovah. And then further proving that, just from verse number 2, we were just told that He is the one, Jesus, the person of Jesus, created the world. He is the one that created the world. So we see that being retaught here in verse number 10, that Jesus is the creator of 
the world. He is the one in the beginning lay, that laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of His hands. So not only is the, the Word of God, He's God. Look at verse number 11. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So notice here it says that the Lord, and who is it talking about? When we look this quotation up, it's, it's from, as I said, Psalm chapter no, number 102, verses 25 through 27. It's talking about Jehovah. And you know who it says is the same? Here? Jehovah is the same. Speaking about Jehovah, we'll go in your Bible to Hebrews, I believe it's chapter number 12. It's Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, sorry. The same book. Look at Hebrews 13, look at verse number 8. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8 says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So who is the same? Jesus Christ. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here in Hebrews chapter number 1, this is a quotation from the Old Testament talking about Jehovah. And it says that Jehovah is the same. He says, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That's because Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Very strong proof of that. It says also there how the earth is going to change. Now, I don't want to uh, delve too deep into this. Like I said, there's so much doctrine here too. You know, uh, this, could, this could cause your mind just to become, you know, uh, real cluttered, and I don't want this to be real discombobulated in your brain. But also, this is a very strong passage to prove that uh, you know, the, the idea of annihilationism of this earth, that this earth that we live on today is going to totally be, you know, annihilated. And that there will be a, a completely new created, newly created earth that we will dwell in. Uh, which is what's referred to in Revelation 21 as the new heavens and the new earth. You can actually, I believe, uh, uh, debunk this with this verse. This is a strong verse that, that helps you understand actually what is taking place because many Baptists believe that the earth that we live on today is going to totally be destroyed and annihilated. And it's not going to exist any longer. And that God's going to create a completely different creation, like a newly created, that does not exist today, earth. And that is what Revelation 21 is talking about. Well, I don't believe that. And if you look here at this passage, this is actually a good passage to prove that that's not true. Because notice what it says in verse 12. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. Now let's talk about the heavens and the earth from verse 10. So he's going to fold up the heavens and the earth. And they shall be, look at this, changed. So what does it say is going to happen? It's going to be changed. Now does that sound familiar? They shall be changed. Does it make you think of a verse? You know what verse it makes you think of? 1 Corinthians 15. We shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, right? What's it talking about? You're going to be receiving a what? A new body, right? It's because it's the same subject. In Revelation 21, you know what God says when He creates a new heaven? I make all things new. That is the consummation, if you will, of that line of making things new. And the same way in which He's going to make the new earth new is the same way he makes our bodies new. Let me ask you this question. Is he going to just annihilate the body that you have today and then just give you a newly created body that you never possessed? What's he going to do? It's going to change it. But do you know what the Bible refers to it as? New. It's a new body. We're going to be changed. It's going to be a new body that we're going to receive. It's going to be a glorified body. Well, guess what? The book of Ecclesiastes tells us this as well, that this earth is going to be here forever. It's never going anywhere. But that doesn't mean it's going to remain like this, just like your bodies aren't going to remain the way they are today. He's going to change it, and He's going to make it new. And it takes place in Revelation 21, where He consummates everything and make all things new. This verse right here says, They shall perish. It's talking about the heavens and the earth. Just like your flesh that you have today will perish. Same exact way. It all makes perfect sense. And this is a good verse to prove that the earth, that is the new heaven and the new earth that will be there, is this same earth today but God will change it and He will make it new. Uh, verse number 13 says this, <clears throat> But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So notice the, the still the same theme. And what is it? That Jesus is greater than the angels. That He never said any of these things to the angels. You know, uh, verse number 14, Are they not all ministering spirits 
sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Now that's referring to the angels again, saying that the angels, what is their purpose? This verse, this is an important verse. Hebrews 1.14 actually gives you the purpose of why angels were created. What is their purpose? They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. We see this happening in the Bible. There's multiple examples. Uh, uh, one very great example where it's, it's the epitome of it. Because uh, ministering is serving. And oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, you know, uh, people uh, that are serving. What are they doing? They're, they're serving food. They're waiting tables like the deacons did. Like um, Mary and Martha. You know, it's talking about she uses the word serving or ministering. You look in the Old Testament, there's a time when Elijah's real tired after he slew the prophets of Baal. He goes and he lays down under a juniper tree and he falls asleep and he wakes up and what does he see? There's an angel there. And what's the angel doing? It's ministering to him. You know what it's doing? The angel's making food for him and cooks the food for him and gives it to him so that he could you know, have strength and he can go in the strength of that food. That angel was sent there to minister for him because why? He was an heir of salvation. He was an heir of salvation. Why is the word heir mentioned there? Because it's, still, it's speaking about those that are conformed to the image of his son. Elijah was a son of God. You know, the true sons of God are, are, of course we have, you know, the only begotten of the Father. We have the Son of God who, who came and was born in the flesh. And through Him, we have the ability to also be a son of God. I'm going to end here. I want you to go to John chapter number 1. We're actually given the definition of the sons of God or what a son of God is. John chapter number 1. We need to hang our hat on clear scripture on things. We need to allow really clear scriptures, the real clear ones, where we are just, you know, things are defined for us. That's where we need to get our doctrine from. John chapter number 1, look at verse number 12. It says this, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I mean, the Bible is extremely clear here. If I were to ask you, who is the Son of God, the answer would be those that believe on His name. Amen. That's who the sons of God are. Hebrews chapter number 1 is clearly teaching that Jesus is greater than the angels because He is the Son of God, and they are not the Son of God. He never, God never said to any of the angels, Thou art my Son this day, have I have begotten thee. You know what else He never said? I will be to them a father, him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He never said that to the angels. He never said that. Do you know what that means? That they're not a son. That's why it's telling you they never said that. That's why it started off that he has a better name. By inheritance, he has a better name. What does that mean? What's his name? Because it's inheritance. You're a son. That's, what, that's who inherits things are sons, right? And so it all culminates there in Hebrews chapter number 1. And, it's, and it tells you, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? Now what's an heir? It's a son. Right? It's speaking about a son. So you have to have the right definition of who the sons of God are when you get to verse number 14, don't you? You have to understand who... You see why it's important? Because verse number 14 is telling you that there are heirs. There is someone that is going to inherit salvation. It's an heir of salvation, right? You know, and who is it? Well, Elijah is an example. Because why? Because the angels ministered to him. I can give you an example of that. Right? So who are the sons of God? They're not angels. The you know, only begotten Son of God is Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in Christ, we are conformed to His image. When God looks at us, He sees His Son. So you know what you are? He reckons you or accounts you as one of His children as well, as a son of God. At the moment that you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a son of God. Amen. And you can prove from Hebrews chapter number 1 that Jesus is greater than the angels because Jesus is a son of God and is called a son of God and the angels are not. That's actually what the whole passage is about all the way down through there. It's very important to understand that. It's not confusing at all. The angels are not the son of God. There we were talking much about uh, the sonship of Christ. If you notice, that was the theme. Pretty much all throughout there, it started in the very beginning talking about him being the son and it carried on about why, why this is an important role, and it spoke about you know, the excellence of the, you know, uh, Jesus being 
the Son of God and why that is so great and so important. Now, angels are powerful, aren't they? They're powerful, but the Son's far greater than the angels. And it even goes so far as to make sure that you understand that the Son, He is God. God, it refers to Him as. Repeatedly, it refers to Him as Lord. You look that up, you know who it is? Jehovah. Jehovah is the Son of God. So right in the very beginning, what does the book of Hebrews do? It gives glory and honor from the very beginning, especially verse number 3. Talking about how He's the brightness of His glory to who? To the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a, a strong theme throughout the book of Hebrews is... You know, Jesus Christ being, uh, uh, you know, Jehovah, his deity, and him being greater than, you know, the high priest. We're going to see that later. And the greatness of Jesus. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for Hebrews chapter number 1. Uh, we thank you for all the knowledge there, dear Lord. Uh, we ask you that you would give us an understanding, help everyone to... There's a lot of information all at one time. Help us all to think about it, dear Lord, and dwell upon it, to read it over and over, to take Bible studies seriously, to have you know the book of Hebrews on our mind uh, when uh, Wednesday is coming. Help us to care about your word, to want to learn about it. Help us to love coming to church, to enjoy church. Help us to love our brethren. Help us to, uh, to uh, love your word, as I said. Help us to read it daily and to uh, uh, desire to, to grow in the knowledge of the word of God. We ask you to bless us and be with us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 <clears throat>